if you were just to look at market value of equity of banks and the book value of equity of banks, these are two uh, statistics that are entering into economic models. People are not really agreeing on which one should enter those, but they diverged completely during the crisis. It's just an aggregate statistic, but it tells us a lot about like what's going on. I mean, if you just look at the book equity, it tells you that accounting values often mask risk exposures um, and even realize the risk in a crisis. And maybe also market equity sometimes um, overreacts, but at the same time, they were in fact much earlier on catching up to the to what was going on in the banking sector than book equity was. I'm Juliana Begenau. I'm a system professor of finance at Stanford's Graduate School of Business. So my research is generally um, really focused on um, banks and banking and the measurement of risk in banking. There's a lot of methods in trying to figure out what's the risk of banking, and I believe the approach that I bring here is both novel and also applicable to particularly the question that our banks are facing and the type of uh, risk that they are taking. What is often a concern is like that regulators and academics often are lagging behind what are the new risks that they are taking and spotting the risk. You see that a lot of times that the core reports, these are kind of the regulatory filings, often introduce new variables after the fact. <laughs> so, which is very difficult in order like, for us because that's kind of the data that we are using as academics in order to figure out what type of risk that is taking. So one needs to have like kind of a fairly, in some sense, precise but a broad approach in order to figure out what are actually new risks and where they could evolve and where to zoom in on, on banks actually and what are the risks they're having. So it's a kind of a well-tested method. It's called kind of the replicating portfolio approach. A lot of financial management firms uh, do that. That's what we teach also our MBA students, kind of whether how to value companies while well, you're kind of figuring out what are the cash flows that these uh, companies have and what is the underlying risk. And then you're trying to figure out what's my best alternative to these cash flows. Mm -hmm. And that allows us to get a sense of what is the uh, what is the risk of those cash flows? And that's uh, in the same way as that's how I approach banks. Banks have, an, in a sense, I mean, they have a very complicated portfolio. What uh, we are trying to do, what I'm trying to do, is kind of um, both to reduce the dimensionality of this complicated portfolio and to map it into something that is, uh, again, that we can make sense of and understand risk exposure. For example, if you're thinking of the banks, although complicated portfolio on one hand, but they do have a lot of securities, which are at bonds, <laughs> treasury bonds, and loans. And those can be mapped fairly easily into uh, a credit market portfolio that has both the same term exposure, so the same interest rate risk exposure that um, banks have, and the same credit risk exposure. And you can verify that the cash flows of those both um, of those portfolios look very similar. And from there, you can then deduce, well, the same risk exposure that this capital market portfolio, this replicating portfolio have, it's the same risk exposure that banks have. By comparing basically um, the cash flows uh, of the banks and what the regulatory reports tell us, what is like the position, the amount of the position, how much um, interest rate exposure is there, <laughs> we can kind of deduce what would be the best alternative <laughs> capital market object that is a kind of a bond portfolio. And from there, we can deduce the risk. So other part of the equation is leverage, right? <laughs> so uh, as anybody that works on credit knows, banks have a lot of leverage, much more than other financial institutions. So even if the asset side doesn't look super risky, if you lever it up by a lot, even though like the loss is like 1%, but you lever it 10 times, then it's like a 10% loss uh, that could hit you. So that's always something to be worried about in the case of banks. I mean, if interest rates rise, the, and they do have um, some notable interest rate exposure, this will make the value of the portfolio decline. R regulators trying to keep tabs on a lot of sorts of risk. <laughs> it's hard to predict. Um, ex ante what's going to be. So, I mean, I think we are, as an economist, we are more tend to be a doctor to diagnose mm -hmm. uh, what the illness was about and maybe to think about treatments and make can some preventative measures. But it's really hard to anticipate who else is going to get sick and what will be the next illness that is going to afflict the banking sector. I think leverage is always a concern. I think one more general concern is to assess really the risk of banks. Um, because a lot of their data comes in, ter in terms of accounting values. For example, net interest margin is one of the key performance statistics of banking. It means like interest income on um, 
assets minus the interest expense on debt. This net interest margin has been, has been very flat over time. And then it has been concluded that there is not a lot of interest rate or even credit risk exposure. It came in times when interest rate risk was high in the 80s particularly, when we had these sudden interest rate spikes in the end of the 70s. And we had also credit exposure crises happened in the 2008-2009 crisis. So it's concerning that kind of risk management of banks is and not an, that they don't use an economic measure, but in some sense non-fundamental uh, partial revenue measures uh, in order to figure out what their risk exposure is. It's not in all the entire story, but that's, that's their answer to do we have interest rate risk? No, our net interest margins are flat. I've also studied um, the cross-section of banks before the um, uh, financial crisis. It was clear that those banks that had a lot of res uh, leverage and fairly high asset risk by the crude standards uh, that regulators allow us to categorize banks uh, into, it was possible to uh, uh, accurate, well, fairly accurately predict uh, which are the banks that are going to uh, lose more in the, in the crisis than others. So there's a lot of studies that have shown also that the same banks that have done risky behavior in the in earlier crisis continue to do so. <laughs> there's both, I mean, there's a predictive nature and there's also kind of persistency and like um, the behaviors that lead to um, further crisis. We spent a lot of time um, in uh, justifying expose why banks are so special, why they cannot be evaluated with our um, standard battery of tools. And um, if banks were um, special, we shouldn't be able to replicate their cash flows with our port bank capital market portfolios, which kind of uh, mimic the risk and the cash flows of a banking sector. So we should do very bad. One thing that banks are special in, they do have monopoly power over the payment system. And that is a unique uh, role of banks, but it also comes at a cost. I mean, operating cost of uh, running this payment system is um, fairly high. So even if you were to um, fund yourself at the deposits, which gives banks a, a rate advantage, um, but you also have to provide as a bank the brick and mortar, the ATM network <laughs> so far. I mean, as long as it's not totally in the online world, you'll need to do that. Recently, there has been a lot of push towards uh, understanding micro movement that can be causally interpreted. Although I think that's very important and should definitely be done. This has come at the expense a little bit at this, um, at this view of like, oh, all aggregate studies are somehow um, wrong or not, not really helpful because we can't really make any causal assessments and we do uh, can actually learn a lot from aggregate movements and aggregate studies and from just like looking at aggregate data. So if you were just to um, trying to explain what banks risk exposure um, is based and what their portfolio looks like based on the regulatory information. We can do this pretty well, and we can describe position by position of banks quite well. But then if we bring it all together, aggregate, <laughs> and look at uh, what would be our implied, the, the implied equity um, position of this replicating portfolio, and compare that to the actual bank stock market data, diverge completely. So it doesn't look a lot alike. And then you can say, oh, well, maybe we did a mistake, but then why does position by position work well? Or does the stock market um, think about banks in a different way? That's another also methodological issue. So if you use stock market data and trying to understand what banks do and where their risk exposure is, which is also a common technique and running stock return regressions and on factors and figuring out where does the factor sensitivity, you will find that banks have no credit risk and no interest rate risk exposure. So what is going on? Uh, why does um, do stock market participants not incorporate that thinking? And also another interesting fact, uh, a lot of um, stock market shareholders in general uh, seem to have valued banks more the more levered they were before the crisis. So, although then they exposed, I mean, suffered the highest losses. So I think this will be an important thinking about um, systematic ways of uh, behavioral or inefficiencies that can come from a source from some behavioral mechanism will be hugely important, I think, for economics.